Uh, I started smoking cannabis when I was about 14. Um, and I can still remember to this very day the excitement when my friend John Pula met me at the end of the path, the footpath to his house. He went to a different school from me and I met him, we met at the end of this footpath every day. And he said to me, I've got it, I've got it. I became outraged at how the law interfered in my desire to do this thing. I mean, I think another important thing to say is at that age, I was getting more of a buzz off the fact that I was doing something naughty than I was getting off the cannabis. And I think that's quite an instructive point, which feeds into the way that prohibition doesn't work. Um, but anyway, quite quickly, I became outraged at the way the law interfered in my life. And so I began to, I've always been a bit of a loud mouth, you know, I've always been opinionated. And I wrote letters to newspapers. Uh, you know, this was obviously a long time before the internet. Um, and eventually I, I sat down and wrote a report in 1983 when I discovered that the Home Affairs Committee, which had only itself just been formed, was doing an inquiry into dangerous drugs. And I sat down and wrote a report about cannabis. I pulled on a lot of different sources from it. Most of those sources are now out of print. Um, and I put forward an argument and I was invited to give evidence to the committee. Um, and you know, I'm proud to say that since then, since 1983, which is however many years ago, uh, every single inquiry that's been held in Parliament ever since, I have given evidence that. Um, and the case, I believe that the case I put forward then, and that document's still available on my website if anybody wants to see it, I believe that the case I put forward then was very powerful. And that was five to six years before the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. So you lay on top of the arguments I put forward then, they weren't just my arguments, lots of people were making them, but you lay the discovery of the ECS on top of that, and the case from that point on, which from the end of the 80s, became overwhelming, you know? Uh, and, and the denial of uh, any progress towards uh, better access towards cannabis since then is, a, is an outrage against the whole of humanity. Um, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I try to stay away from conspiracy theories. Uh, you know, I've always rejected the big pharma conspiracy theory because, you know, particularly in the States, you see people demonize the pharmaceutical industry to a quite ludicrous extent. You know, it's a fact that the pharmaceutical industry has saved millions of people's lives and given millions more people more time with their families. You know, so you can't, you can't just write it off. Obviously, there are bad apples. We know about that. We know about opioid overprescribing, et cetera. Um, but nevertheless, there is a huge establishment resistance to cannabis. Uh, it's partly a morality thing, um, but it's mainly about fear. Um, and I think that's one of the great things that the CBD business, and you know, the sort of event we're at now, uh, is doing. It's destigmatizing, taking away fear, um, and, and showing that a lot of these things are completely unnecessary. The problem with the medical reforms at the moment is not, you know, a lot of people are still complaining about the government. They're saying, you know, why hasn't the government done what it said it was going to do? Well, you know, I'm no fan of the government, so I'm, you know, very... I take my hat off to the government. The new regulations that came in last November are unbelievably open, unbelievably flexible. You know, there's no restriction on what you can prescribe for. Apart from not smoking, there's no restriction on the form in which the cannabis can be. So what, what more could we have asked for, really? There was no more we could ask for. Uh, but now what we have is the medical establishment preventing access. Um, and I, I think they're absolutely atrocious. I think they're irresponsible. I think they're cowardly. Um, I think they uh, demean the authors of them. I, th I, th I think they should be ashamed of themselves. I really do. I think I'd go I'm that strong about it. I think it's disgraceful that these people are letting down the people of Britain with, with, with their cowardly, inadequate, pathetic attempt to deal with this issue. Uh, but it's because they're frightened about it. And the reason they're frightened about it is it comes back to basic human emotions. The reason they're frightened about it is because cannabis makes them feel inadequate. Now, not, not all doctors, obviously, there are some very good doctors, but cannabis makes doctors in the... You've got to remember, the, doc, the doctors in the medical establishment aren't, don't practice anymore. You know, the people at the head of the Royal Colleges, they don't sit down and deal with these awful things called patients anymore. 
Um, and, and so, you know, they, they built their career up through that and they've established their opinions and their positions over time. They don't want to see anything change. But cannabis requires you to take a completely different view of medicine. It's, it, it's, um, it's quite an old-fashioned word now, but holistic. Um, it, it requires a much more holistic approach. You know, a lot of people, not just doctors, dismiss medicinal cannabis because they say, you're telling me it can help with everything. Well, that's ridiculous. You're obviously talking nonsense. But that's the whole point, that if you understand the first thing about the endocannabinoid system, you'll understand that it can help with everything. Because the endocannabinoid system, the largest neurotransmitter network in the body, impacts every other neurotransmitter network, impacts every other physiological system. You know, it, it, it can affect everything. Um, and so it does require a much more open-minded, holistic approach to medicine. And that threatens doctor's status. Because let's remember, doctors until relatively recently have been used to having their word taken as gospel. Um, and that's not the case. You know, I, I don't want to smear all doctors, by the way, because I've got some very good friends who are doctors. And I, mean, I think as Mike Barnes said yesterday in his talk yesterday, uh, one of the problems is they've given, they've given prescribing rights to specialists only. And specialists have the wrong frame of mind because they're very focused on specifics. You know, it needs to go to general practitioners. I think the other thing as well is that you know, what, what a patient or you know, a, a consumer is concerned about is symptoms. You know, it is symptoms. I mean, obviously, if you've got a deadly disease, you want it cured. But I mean, in the short term, what you're concerned about is how it's making you feel. And, and cannabis, you know, again, I mean, I, I'm also, you know, I knock back some of the what I call cannabis evangelism because there are people who go too far. And whilst we, you know, whilst certainly there are remarkable stories, and I don't deny those, um, cannabis is not yet a proven curative medicine. It's a proven palliative medicine. And if we look at it from that point, that it deals with symptoms, not with causes. If we look at it from that point of view, much easier to deal with. I mean, I believe, well, not believe, because belief is the wrong term. I don't like to say it, but I consider because it's a consideration based on evidence. I consider that cannab cannabinoids do have curative properties, but we have yet to harness them to, to sort of fully develop them. So I believe there will be curative medicines developed from cannabis, but we're not there yet. Um, so, you know, that's where we are. So, so everything I do in this space is driven by my passion for reform, all right, for access, for enabling access. Um, and the reason that I'm now involved in the business is because I, have, I saw right from the very beginning, and I'm going back as far as 2012, before most people had even heard of CBD, when I first got involved with the, the first beginnings of the CBD business, because I saw very clearly that if we could show that we were behaving responsibly in regulating this legal aspect of cannabis, um, then that would drive reform. Um, and it has done, you know, uh, as I just said in my talk, you know, that what's happened to CBD in the past, particularly in the past two to three years, has had a huge influence on the medical cannabis reforms last year because it de it's done a lot to destigmatize cannabis. The, not all the stigma has yet gone, but we're an awful long, long way along the line. Um, and, and so that's why I'm here. Um, now to move on to the, 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 you know, the, the point that I know you're dying for me to get to, um, th th this was the reason that I, together with um, Tony Calamita and Tom Rowland, who are the directors of Love Hemp, got together, uh, 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 prompted initially by the MHRA intervention saying you've got to stop selling CBD as medicine, got together and said we need to start a trade association. And so the three of us set up the Cannabis Trades Association. Uh, and we hired a guy called Mike Harlington to run it. Now, I'm not going to go into any details because it'll just be boring to everybody. Um, but let's just say that after two years of working with Mike, and I worked very, very closely with Mike, I know the man very, very well, um, we decided it just couldn't go any further. And so the Love Hemp as a company and Tom Rowland, who was on the board, resigned and I resigned and we walked away and we decided to set up Canapro or Cannabis Professionals. And Canapro takes forward the original principles and values that were at the beginning of the CTA. I don't knock what the CTA does. I think many, most, 
all except one of the people who work in the CTA I've got all the time in the world for, I think they're great people. A lot of the members of the CTA are also CANAPRO certified. All right, and the work, can, the work the CTA does on compliance, I'm all for it. Um, uh, so I'll say no more than that about it. But I mean, Can CANAPRO, really what it offers is it offers a low cost alternative. You know, we, we charge you a flat 120 pounds we don't make any money out of it. It's, in fact, what I can tell you is the, mo the, most, the most expensive um, work we've done on behalf of the industry was about novel foods, where we went and got a QC's opinion and we hired a firm of uh, lawyers, uh, you know, 400 pound an hour lawyers, uh, and after you know, lots of negotiation and letters back and forth, we put a formal warning letter into the FSA telling them what the consequences would be if they took any enforcement action, so we drew a line in the sand. Now what I can tell you is that what that cost us, the total value of that legal work, far exceeds the total value of all the registration fees Canapro has had in since we began. So you know, if we, what we're doing is providing a service to the industry, we're part of CLEAR and we're doing that because we believe it drives reform. So, so, so that's the purpose for us. But I do think as well, I've come to the conclusion more recently that with the medical reforms, because of the, uh, the inertia in the medical profession or medical establishment, um, I do think that the only way that, that we will get access to all the people who need, need cannabis is full legalisation. So in a way I've gone back to the beginning. Because having come through all this sort of more and more business-like, more and more you know, scientific approach to legal art, to reform, um, I've come to the end of it, we, we've make, made the breakthrough in, into science and medicine, but now actually I think we need to go back to the beginning and we just need to say legalise it. That's the only way that it will really happen. And I, and I think, I honestly believe that we're much closer to that now than many people think. I, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I wouldn't trust Boris uh, with a fiver, uh, but I do quite like him um, and, 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 I, and yeah, I do think he is fundamentally a liberal. I think he can also be an idiot as well, but can't we all, you know? Um, uh, and I do think there's a good chance that he could see legalisation of cannabis as a, as, as a, a clever move post-Brexit and post-election. I mean, I, I've been saying five years for quite a long time. Um, and, you know, those MPs came back from uh, Canada and said five to ten years. Um, I, 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 would, I would say two years now, I really would. Um, and I've always said, and a lot of people hate me for this, uh, I've always said it's more likely under a Tory government. It always has been. It's a Tory policy. Because it's about, you know, real Tory values. You know, we haven't had a, I'm not a member of the Tory party anymore. I resigned when, when um, Theresa May became leader. Um, but, you know, fundamental Tory, liber Tory values are about liberty, personal responsibility, uh, you, you, and small government and, and those values are exactly the sort of values that you need to drive so you know all, all this we hate the Tories you know it, 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 it's just, just misconstrued um, and, and so if we go back to a Tory government with the sort of with the sort of liberal attitudes that Boris Johnson represents I really think we stand a very good chance I think, I think happily most people do um, and they you know they do associate CBD with cannabis they know that's what it is. They know it's a legal form of cannabis, I think is the way the man in the street sees it, or the woman in the street sees it, if you like. Um, and I think uh, that has taken some of the stigma away from THC, but people are still are frightened about it. You know, and I see people, I see people who are supposedly eminent uh, scientists, not, well, not so much scientists as doctors, publish, publish in the press claims that medical cannabis is cannabis with the psychoactive element re removed. I mean, you know, such utter nonsense um, and uh, so there is still a degree of misinformation around but we've made a hell of a lot of progress you know a hell of a lot of progress